So the scripture for our text beginning this evening in, in Revelation chapter 20 and 21. And the other text that we're going to be in actually is Luke chapter 16. I just want to look specifically at some matters that I think most of us know, but perhaps have not put two and two together. But I think oftentimes that we use some terms that are so generic, oftentimes that it's good for us to clarify um, Bible teaching. And specifically this evening, I want to um, look at the matter, the real places of heaven and hell and uh, the lake of fire and the new heaven and the new earth. And I would like to look at what the scripture distinctly, clearly says so that we can have a better um, a better concept when we conjure in our imaginations. We touched on this a couple of weeks ago. I mentioned some things uh, that, that we'll actually be teaching this evening. But I want to do more than mention tonight. I just want to just let mention look at the scripture. If, I don't know if you uh, take notes in your Bible or not. I have, uh, I, I've bought for quite a few years, I've used the Bibles that are printed by local church Bible publishers. And they have nice margins in them, sort of like the Cambridge Bibles that they used to make, except they charge you $300 for the Cambridge Bibles. And back when they started printing these, local church publishers printed at cost these Bibles for about, uh, they started like 50 Now a Bible like this can be ordered for around like $65. And it's not... I mean, let me just run a little advertisement for local church Bible publishers. It's not, uh, it's not bonded leather. The covers on these Bibles, it's full grain Morocco. It's like real leather. You can mess with it, put it in the sun, and just iron yourself back out. It's tough. And this Bible withstands my abuse. And so, anyway, but I take notes in my Bible. When I was a child, my parents worked very hard to teach me a respect for God's Word. They try to instill respect in me. So they would say things like, you don't stand on a Bible. You know, I found out my Sunday school teachers were terrible. Because, you know, I stand alone on the Word of God. I remember a Sunday school teacher putting the Bible down. They sang that song. So, you know, talking about standing on the Bible, my parents said that was strictly forbidden. Uh, you don't throw your Bible down. You place it. You don't put another book on top of your Bible. Like Bible etiquette. Anybody ever taught Bible etiquette? You were Brother Matt, right? Okay, good. We came from like the same kind of influences, right? A lot of the same... So, Bible etiquette, and I think those things are fine, uh, but I also found out that there's a lot of error in some of the concepts with it, because uh, as a child, it's difficult to distinguish between the concept of this being the Word of God and the, the fact that this is, a, this is where the Word of God is represented or printed. And so, oh, phew, those things, yeah. And it's an iPhone too, isn't it? It's like double whammy, <laughs> double bad. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't have my normal people to pick on here this evening. So Brother Matt's like front center. So I can't pick on your wife. You wouldn't like that. Yeah, oh. oh. <laughs> so anyway, well, um, but sometimes when things were expressed, the concepts would be harmful. So there was a debate. I used to hear people debate about whether it's okay to take notes in your Bible or not, whether it's okay to write in your Bible. Now, there are some people who should not take notes in their Bible. I think we could just make that statement and leave it at that, right? Or would you like me to elaborate on it? Why should people not take notes in their Bible? Well, I used to borrow books from a guy that if you turn the page wrong, like he could open it again and tell. He would hold the spine tightly closed together and peek into the book when he read it because he was ODD or something like that. He had something about... Uh, or what's it called when you have a phobia? He's afraid of crinkled OCD? papers. OCD, thank you. Thanks for the word. Thanks for the better acronym. Appreciate it. So he was OCD about his books. I got to where I wouldn't borrow his books anymore because, you know, if you turn a page and, like, you know, bent the page a little bit, it just it would have, yeah, a book's a book. You know, it's just a book. But he liked his books to look, sit on the bookshelf and look like they'd never been read even after he'd read them. Imagine that, you know. So, anyway. Uh, so if you're that kind of a person, writing in your Bible will be such a distraction to you when you read it that it would be better not to write in it. Okay, uh, So don't write in your Bible if that's you. If that isn't you, I recommend that you make your Bible a personal commentary. And I understand that some people like... I, I, I have had, in four years, I had good use out of a... Uh, Matthew, not a Matthew Henry, uh, uh, Thomas Chain Reference Bible. I found that to be very, very helpful 
for cross-referencing and so forth. And then I made my own cross-referencing. Did it myself. And I found that to be way more useful and a little bit more accurate than Thomas Chain's reference. So, uh, what's that? Thompson. Thompson, what did I say, Thomas Chain? Yeah. I've said some really funny things uh, on Sunday nights. That's for sure. So, I acknowledge that. Apologize for it if it bothers you. Uh, Thompson Chain. So, that, that all being said, I do recommend, if you write in your Bibles, to cross-reference some of the scriptures this evening that when we talk about heaven. For instance, uh, we will be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 briefly. We'll be in Luke chapter 16. And uh, when we're in Revelation chapter 20, uh, in verses 12 and 13, uh, we won't have time to reference Daniel 12, but Daniel 12 would be a good cross-reference. Daniel 12, the first several verses of that chapter. So, uh, you know, would, be, would give some insight on... Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13, and so forth. Hey, that's a lot of rambling. Let's go ahead and read the text, and let's talk about heaven and hell this evening and see if we can understand some distinct characteristics of those places. And again, I mentioned some of the things a couple of weeks ago, but I really want to focus on them tonight. Verse 12 of Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Verse 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, or chapter 21, verse 1, I should say. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God and God shall wipe away the, all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. But he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. Let's stop there, and we will ask the Lord to help us with our understanding for the next several minutes, shall we? Father, please do help us as we go to your word and we endeavor to glean understanding, specifically about heaven, about hell, about the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and about our place and in, in our part in those places. And again, Father, help us to keep our perspective as well to include those who are not going to heaven. I pray that you would help us to see the value of souls as you see them. We pray this and pray for help in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to begin with just to kind of throw some, some things out there, and then we'll kind of get into the area we're going to focus on. So we'll begin this evening with death and hell uh, being cast into the lake of fire, dead and death and hell delivering up the dead, which were in them. You ever talked with someone, you ever spoken with someone about eternal matters, and they dismissed eternal matters with the argument that they're people just dying going to the ground. How many of you know somebody that believes that there's no life after death? It would be the Sadducees of Jesus' day, of course, wouldn't it? It would be uh, many Jews today. Now, it's fascinating to me, and I guess fascinating because it's so illogical, that a person who believes there's no life after death would be at all religious. I don't understand religion for the sake of religion. You understand what I mean? In other words, if... Uh, if I could understand my Jewish friends correctly that don't believe that there is a heaven or hell, they believe and practice their Jewish faith and go through a lot of cultural, high-pressured activity their entire life for something that has no eternal ramification. I have met, I've had people explain this in honest moments with me by saying this, well, you know what, a lot of it is about inclusion, you know, I pay my dues to the synagogue and I function in the Jewish community because that's where I rub shoulders. It's how I do business. It's just I want to be included in the community. 
And so if I were to understand them correctly, they would say that they're religious for the sake of inclusion. And I could under, I guess I could understand that that's what they believe. I just wouldn't do that. I don't know about you, but if I didn't believe in eternal life, I wouldn't be playing religion at all. So I think that it's probably somewhat of a disingenuous answer overall. I think that they think that there's something to something somewhere. In other words, there's, there's some kind of some sort of God. I reject, though, personally, the notion that any person honestly believes there's no life after death. People do argue that there's no life after death, but I do not believe that anyone from the bottom of their heart believes that. I think that sometimes they use arguments to be able to cloak what's in the bottom of their heart, if you will, to be able to cloak that in, uh, with enough reason that will allow them to be able to set it aside and not deal with it. The fact of the matter is most people just don't deal with eternity. Isn't it true? Uh, I penned last week, I penned the text for a track that I'm working on. I've been saying I'm going to do it for years, but I actually penned the text for it last week. My tract, not interested. And it's for people that when I try to share the gospel with them, tell me they're not interested. And uh, just kind of gave several reasons why I thought that the person was not interested. But at the end of the track is an appeal to be interested because it's an eternal matter that I'm trying to talk to you about. Most of the time when I tell somebody, when I approach somebody to share the gospel with them, they say not interested. They don't know who I am. They don't know what I'm trying to share. They don't know why I've come. They've just, they tell me they're not interested. And my question always is, what aren't you interested in? You don't know who I am. You don't know what I'm trying to say. You know, how in the world could you know that you're not interested? Because the fact of the matter is I'm not being, uh, I'm not over-exaggerating by saying what I've come to talk to them about is absolutely not only the most interesting thing there is, but the most important subject in the world. You know, so when somebody tells me they're not interested, I just, you know, so I usually write, I read a tract and it's a little bit sarcastic, a little bit jabbing, a little bit of my personality. It was my tract that I'm writing, but it ultimately appeals to people to be interested in eternal matters. I think a lot of people are not interested, though, wouldn't you agree? Because they don't want to deal with something. And uh, I understand that sometimes. Men, how many of you like to deal with making important decisions the moment you get home from work? <laughs> get home from work, long day, and you sit down and your wife says, we need to know right now. My wife doesn't, isn't able to speak that way. She doesn't have a voice for that. So, But your wife sounds exactly like that. So, you know, we need to know right now. We need to. And you just say, not now. I don't. If I make a decision, I think of this, I, I express this sometimes. If I make a decision right now, I know for certain I will not make a good decision. And I tell people that when they pressure me for things. That happens with eternal matters a lot of times too, doesn't it? Where people think in their mind, they kind of categorize things. I'm going to deal with this someday. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about eternal matters someday, but right now I'm not interested. By the way, let me share a testimony. My 100-year-old great aunt got assurance of her salvation last week. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Went to Kansas. She had been, she fell down, broke her arm, and they put her in rehab. And then in rehab, she got pneumonia. She went to the hospital. Last week, she asked my mom, when's Ryan coming? And my mom said, well, he'd probably be here by the end of the week. She said, I think I can hold on until then. But she, we thought she just wanted to say goodbye to me. I walked into the hospital room, Melissa and I did, and she didn't say, hello, nice to see you, anything like that. Her voice was all hoarse. She said, I need to make sure that I'm going to heaven. And uh, she prayed and asked Jesus to, to save her. We don't know for sure whether she'd ever done that before. She thinks maybe she had, maybe she had. But we got verses that showed her how to be sure that she had eternal life. And she's born again. And I'll tell you something. She's 100 years old, and I've never heard her talk about, I've never heard her talk about death or meeting God. She says, now I know I'm ready to meet God. I've never heard her talk about meeting God. But she's at a stage in life, I think, where all of a sudden she realized, you know, I better deal with this. It's time to deal with this. A lot of people never do. You know, most of us probably won't make it to 100, like Great Aunt Margie. By the way, she uh, by the end of the week, she, she, she's uh, back in rehab. She looks fantastic. She's, she's healed up from so many things. Uh, broken arms and bones, and she ruptured her spleen in her late 90s. And uh, had surgeries and just recovered. So that's pretty neat, isn't it, Brother Matt? It's interesting, Brother Matt. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you don't want to talk about medical things. But <laughs> so, anyway, you're still here. <laughs> Now, the fact of the matter is, though, that eternal matters are of utmost importance. 
And as believers, we really need to understand how to not only engage people, but we need to know facts. And a lot of times we use really nebulous, generic terms like heaven and hell. And it's not as though those are inaccurate terms, but heaven is a reference to the space above us that is not earth. It's not necessarily a reference in every instance of the place where God lives, where God is. But we do use generically a lot of terms, don't we? The term heaven. And to talk about heaven. Well, okay, let me, before I get, get, I get ahead of myself there, let me finish about the death and the hell thing. So a lot of people will say they don't believe in life after death. And some people will claim they believe the Bible is the word of God. And they'll try to take words like Gehenna, which we get our word hell from, or they'll take uh, terms that have physical, global positioning sensor or uh, uh, situation. What does GPS stand for? I'm a, I better quit acronyms tonight. Yeah. Anyway, I'm having trouble with acronyms. So GPS, folks. <laughs> the GPS coordinates are the actual physical location of a place. And they'll try to say, well, that's just a place and it's just a reference. You know, well, no, my friend, there's eternal life. There are eternal matters. And the fact that the dead are brought from heaven and hell, for any person who claims to believe the Bible is the word of God, don't talk to them about the place outside the city of Jerusalem. Talk to them about the time when there's final judgment before God destroys heaven and earth and creates a new heaven and earth. Talk to them about that and say, listen, these are people. Death and hell are giving up the dead that are in them and they're being judged. It's the second death. It's the final judgment. And this is where it's at in the Bible. Revelation chapter 20. Uh, or uh, yeah, chapter 20. And you need to know that. You need to take people there. Matter of fact, I, I don't want to scare people. I don't want to frighten people. I don't think that Revelation is as frightening as a lot of people consider, but I guess maybe it's not for uh, you know toddlers or something like that. But you know, you and I ought to sometimes lose some sleep over hell. It's not a terrible thing for a believer to lose some sleep over hell. And every one of us ought to be in the place where we do not lose sleep over hell because of concern for ourselves, but it's because of the reality that so many are going there. Amen. Friend, I do not know, God knows the statistics of people that are hell-bound. All I know is that there's more people going to hell than they're going to heaven, from my experience. And it seems from reading, reading the Scripture that that's been universally true in every generation. And that is a serious matter. It's a very serious matter. We know the Scripture says that hell hath enlarged herself. And I do believe taking the Scripture literally, did I say Scripture literally? It's taking the Scripture literally. I'm going to listen to myself sometime. I've got to say some hilarious things. Uh, taking the Scripture literally, I do believe that hell enlarging itself is because it was full. In other words, it's a place where there are going to be more people in eternal torment than there will be in heaven. And that, my friend, ought to be a, a distressing concept for all of us. If you're a person who tries to solve problems, riddles, and puzzles, you ought to lay awake at night trying to figure out what we're going to do about people going to hell. And what we're going to do to make sure that as few people as possible go there. And we ought to try to figure out how that we can make sure that anyone that goes to hell does so over the glaring truth that they've received from us. It's a serious matter. Well, it's literal. Death and hell are ultimately cast in the lake of fire. And then we begin our description where we'll spend some time this evening focusing on the new heaven and the new earth. And I just want to look at these places as uh, literal places. I will go to Luke 16 momentarily. Uh, but I want to look at this description of heaven first, and then I want to, uh, again, kind of tie or bookend uh, what we've looked at tonight by looking at, again, uh, death and hell. Verse 1, John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Well, that's important to remember, isn't it? John is emphasizing that the heaven and that the earth that you and I are familiar with is passed away. Here's where I try to offer a little bit of satiric comfort to people who are concerned with the preservation of the earth overly much. I said overly much because I think some people are not as concerned 
with the preservation of the earth as they ought to be, and yet some people are more concerned. I will say, if you don't believe in eternal life, that being concerned about preserving an earth which happened entirely by accident, you know, and can unhappen by the same unhappy accident, shouldn't really concern anybody. If this world that we live in, if this earth that we live in, is simply an accident, the concept of preserving an accident is ludicrous. Well, why save the earth for future generations if the future generations don't matter? You, know, you understand where I'm coming from? But from a biblical Christian perspective, by the way, that is, that's, that's an unsaved person's perspective. A Christian doesn't have that perspective. A Christian has a stewardship mentality with the world, with the earth. The Christian says, well, God said that I'm supposed to have dominion over the earth, and that has everything to do with stewardship. It doesn't just mean to kill everything and eat it. It means I'm actually supposed to take care of it. And I, as a believer, I recognize that the only time that the earth will be truly stewarded properly, I don't think stewarded is a proper word, but I just used it, you know what it means, so we'll go with it. Okay, but the earth will not be properly managed until Jesus Christ rules and reigns. Amen. But it will still be sin cursed. And there will be an ultimate rebellion of individuals that come up against Christ. And at that time, Jesus is going to destroy them. And then He is going to destroy the heaven and earth. The Bible says they're going to be passed away. And God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. The old heaven and the old earth are going to be passed away. Now, here's a practical question for you. If heaven and earth are passed away, where is everybody in heaven going to be when they're passing away? Well, obviously, the language is speaking of what we know to be the heavens, isn't it? Speaking of the atmosphere. By the way, this is a little excursus as well, but just for fun for you nerds. Um, and yes, you're a nerd. If you think you're not, you are for sure. This is um, just for fun for you. Um, oh man, I almost forgot it. I'm not a good nerd. Um, hold on a second, it's coming back. Oh, there is no alien life. That's all I wanted to say. The reason I know there's no alien life is because um, God, if there were, they would be in the heavens, right? And, we're, and uh, it would be inconsistent with the character of God, particularly if they were unsinful beings. Now, there are angels. I believe the angels are certainly not restricted to this earth. And so they're, they're the prince of the power of the air. But there aren't aliens. There are fallen angels and there are God's angels. And when God destroys the heavens and destroys the earth, where's heaven going to be at? When we talk about heaven, we're talking about where God is. And we ask you, where's God? Or you ask a kid, where's God? What do they say? Huh? He's everywhere. Yeah, that's a good answer. Good job. Where's God? Where is He bodily? Where is God bodily present? When Christ offered the blood, offered His blood, where did He offer it at? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. Where's that? It's in heaven. Okay, there you go. She said, in heaven. Okay, so we have to understand that the term heaven and earth the word heaven in this context, of course, is referencing the heavens, that which is above us. But where God is, he is in his on his throne. Where he is, he is really in what we're going to see here is the new Jerusalem. There's the earthly Jerusalem, there's the heavenly Jerusalem. And uh, so let's look at this description of when God makes a new heaven and a new earth. A lot of Christians uh, know this and a lot don't. The Bible says in verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city... New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What is the shape of the earth? Round. Round, right? Yes. Unless you're Kyrie Irving and Shaquille O'Neal. Then it's flat. But aside from those guys, the earth is round. And there's no reason that God, when He makes a new heaven and a new earth, is going to change the shape. You do recognize, don't you, that the New Jerusalem coming down is distinctly separated from the earth. It's a separate location from the earth. Now this is going to be pretty neat because I think it's going to involve some pretty rapid transport. I think it was Brother Matt a couple weeks ago we were actually joking about or talking about uh, the difference between 
sending a space shuttle up to orbit the Earth and what the astronauts actually did when they went to the moon with regard to distance and travel. Heaven is so far that was it the, one of the Russians that when he went out into space said, I don't see God. Who is that? One Yuri of the Gagarin. Russians. Who is it? Yuri Gagarin. Thank you. Yuri's whatever Joel said. said, I don't see God. Heaven's far enough away that he couldn't see heaven. And we're talking not about the heavens. We're talking about where God is, where God dwells, New Jerusalem, where we're going to be. Okay, so there's a heavenly city. That heavenly city is the place where Jesus now is, where he said, I go there to prepare a place for you. That's where our mansions are at. So let's look at a description of that uh, very quickly. But I want us, as we begin to look at the description of that, to recognize that there's a new heaven and a new earth and that they are intended to be occupied or inhabited by us. Now, this is great. Here's why. I, for one, do not want to look like a cherub and float on a cloud playing a harp. That may be your cup of tea, but it's not my cup of tea or coffee or anything else. I want to worship God. The, the more I understand the concept of worship and bowing before God, the more I realize that it's the only thing that really ultimately fulfills me. So I understand that. I want to worship God. But I'll just tell you something. I want to live life. And sometimes when you hear about heaven, you know, you hear things like, yeah, we're just going to worship God for thousands and thousands of years. And actually not thousands of years, millions of years, and trillions of years. And I just think, boy, it's a good thing I'll have a new body because I get really stiff, you know, worshiping that long. That is, we're going to live in the new heaven and the new earth, and the new Jerusalem is going to come down, and we're going to have mansions there, places, apartments. Literally, as I understand the Scripture, as I study the Scripture, this place where God is is actually going to be a place where isn't necessarily our permanent residence that we're always in, but it's a place where we have a residence, sort of like a, a winter home for some of you snowbirds, folks that have a place where, hey, you live up north, but when it gets nasty there, you go and stay in your nice condo on the ocean or something like that, or uh, maybe in the swamp here in, in Florida. Either way, but you have a place, a, a, an apartment or a place, that's also your place, and that's the way it's going to be. We're going to actually be able to be in the New Jerusalem where God is. I certainly don't think we'll be restricted from being there. But we're going to live in the new heaven and new earth. We're going to live in the new earth, and it's going to be a perfect world that we're going to be in. It'll be like the first world where there's no sea, and it's going to be a marvelous place. And the summit or the peak, I guess, or I, I shouldn't say those aren't the correct words to use, but the pinnacle location of the new earth is going to be where the new Jerusalem is descended at. In other words, that will be the place. I mean, that will be the center. Even in studying the Bible, we recognize how important Jerusalem is as the center. For instance, up is always toward Jerusalem. Whichever way uh, this, the Bible describes something, up is always facing toward Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is always the direction. In other words, we think of north, south, east, and west, but a biblical mindset for somebody who understands Israel and the significance of Jerusalem is that Jerusalem is the important direction. So north, south, east, or west, everything is toward Jerusalem with regard to navigation and direction. That's kind of neat, isn't it? And so that'll be the way the new heaven is, except that and the new earth is, except that the new Jerusalem will be the place where God is, come down to the new earth. Now, what a condescension, what a matching of things that could... Could you imagine if where God dwells now, the mansions where Jesus Christ is preparing, the, the, what will be the new Jerusalem, could you imagine if that were to make contact with earth today? You know, we tell people, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God is perfect. Therefore, you and I cannot attain unto God. We cannot reach God. There's a separation from us and God. And that is exactly the problem today. I can't speculate on the location of where God dwelt, but God used to walk in the garden with man in the cool of the day. There used to not be that separation between God and man. And that is going to be precisely the state of affairs. Literally, we will have mansions prepared for us where God is, that new Jerusalem, 
and we'll have access there on a continual basis. That's pretty fabulous, isn't it? We see a description, if you read uh, Revelation chapter 21, uh, you see the, the uh, verse 10, John said he was carried away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now you say descending out of heaven. Well, how could it do that? Well, if you look at the description uh, in verse 17, the, the uh, no, I'm sorry, in verse 15, he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. Verse 16, the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So 12,000 furlongs measured like men would measure them, would be almost exactly 1,500 miles. Now, last week, I drove 3,200 miles. I drove up to, well, I drove more than that, but I drove at least 3,200 miles getting to where I was going. I drove to Kansas and drove back. So 1,615 or something directly there, and I missed some excursion, and then like 1,600 back. So 3,200 miles. So about 100 miles short of where I drove to, I can, I can actually kind of, in my mind, measure, think of that distance. That's a long distance. Now, we'd be going as the crow flies, so it would be somewhat shorter uh, in exact, precise, line-to-line -line measurement. 1,500 miles, my friends, halfway across the United States of America. That's a long ways. And so, heaven, or this new Jerusalem, is described here as a cube. Uh, it's the breadth is as wide and it's as high as it is long, so it's a big square. And so that kind of fits with the apartments, mansions, concept in it. And that's going to be, if you think about it dimensionally, if God creates a new earth with similarities with regard to circumference and size to the earth on which we now dwell, 1,500 miles square and up, I can't imagine, okay, so with the eye, and the curvature of the earth, we can see that something like, is it 10 miles? Is that correct? I think it's something like that. On top of a mountain on a clear day, how far can a person see? I can't think. I, I can't think what the distance is. I've looked it up before, but it's a very long distance. You know, there's places where you can see several states from a, top of, from a peak of a mountain and so forth. Can you imagine a 1,500-mile high structure? How, what's the distance to outer space? 20 miles. What? 20 miles. Something like that, isn't it? Around that, 20 miles? 1,500 miles, Brother Matt. <laughs> that nuts? Are you talking about something that's... The feature, the Earth's feature, is going to be predominantly the New Jerusalem. I mean, it's, it's going to be... You just get from the underside... And you can see it. If you're traveling the earth, you may be on the opposite side of the earth and you can't see you can't see the New Jerusalem. But when you get to the upside, 1,500 miles with the glory of God being the light of it. Enough light for the whole world, for the whole earth. I just cannot imagine the dazzling sight that heaven will be. And we're not talking figuratively here, we're not talking imaginatively, we're talking about a real place that actually exists now that we're going to have access to and it's going to be the predominant feature on a perfect world. It's pretty incredible. So we see that, see some descriptions of it in verse uh, 11. The city, the Bible says, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear, as crystal. Well, that's like diamond. Had a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 14 we saw last week, uh, the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and um, in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And uh, let's look down at verse 18, some more descriptions. The Bible says, In the building of the wall of it, was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. Can you imagine gold that looks like glass? Have you ever seen gold really, really shine? Really, really polished? And literally, I can see this description a little bit here. Can you imagine 
literally having the city pure gold, gold city, 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, uh, 1,500 miles deep or long. It's amazing. And then, uh, by the way, don't buy gold. There's going to be so much of it. <laughs> All the people tell you, that, you know, they're not making any more gold. If I go, don't waste your time, folks. There's going to be, I don't think we'll get tired of it. We'll always be dazzled by it. But we'll always think, why was I worried about that little chunk, that little nugget? That was nothing. Um, <laughs> in uh, verse 18, the building of the wall of it was of jasper. The city was of pure gold, like in a clear glass. And uh, the jasper is like an opaque quartz. And it's... Uh, it's, it is, we understand it as Chalcedony, but that's also described in verse 19. This, the first foundation was Jasper, so there are the foundations that are, that are representing, they have the names of the apostles of the, Lamb, of the Lamb. The second is Sapphire. The third, a Chalcedony. The fourth, an Emerald. The fifth, Sardonyx. The sixth, Sardius. The seventh, Chrysolite. The eighth, Beryl. The ninth, a Topaz. The tenth, a Chrysop Chrysoprasus. The eleventh, a Jason. The twelfth, an Amethyst. So that's pretty impressive. These are the 12 foundations which have inscripted in them the apostles of the Lamb. Now I don't know which apostles get which stones, but hopefully they get to choose their preference. Uh, verse 21, the 12 gates. Remember the 12 gates, what do they represent? The 12 tribes of Israel. They have names for the 12 tribes of Israel. So each of them, the Bible says, is 12 pearls. That's a big oyster. Uh, and the Bible says every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And then the most marvelous feature of heaven, verse 22, I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it, and the city had no need of sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Isn't that wonderful? So the predominant feature of the new earth will be the new Jerusalem, and the predominant feature of this glorious new Jerusalem will be the Lamb. Amen. You ever see or give a nice piece of jewelry? Most of you men hopefully give at least one. Would you give one in your lifetime, you know? A nice piece of jewelry. You ever notice how nice diamonds look in the jewelry store? They look really good in a jewelry store. They do. Uh, you know, you go to the jewelry store and you pay a lot of money for a little rock. And then you leave, and it looked good there. And you leave, and you're like, that's kind of small for that, <laughs> that much money, you know? And it's because of the setting, the lighting, the way that it's featured. And I'll tell you what, they've got some cool settings, don't they? Boxing. You know, people with new technology make YouTube videos unboxing thing. Who cares about the box, right? You, you people are one of those people, you know, if I'm going to buy a new computer, get it out of the box. I don't, you know, but some people take a video, look at the nice box, you know, look at how they're and how this is made, the design. There are literally people that design boxes. I'm going to just tell you something. This is a package I'll be fascinated by and impressed by, I promise you. But I still tell you that in spite of how glorious the new earth and the new heaven are going to be, and how predominant a feature the New Jerusalem is, the biggest thing in the world will be the same as it always has been. And that's God. God is the greatest thing about heaven. He is now, and He will be. So having said that, let's look at a couple of things that ought to be our mindset and our focus today with regard to it. Uh, we know it's going to be a sinless place. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you'll permit. I'll just read verses 1 on down uh, a ways. Paul said, For if we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And I have to say to you that this tabernacle is dissolving. And yours is as well. Tabernacle is talking about it's the word tent, skenos. Uh, it, it, it simply means a temporary dwelling place. And the body that you and I live in is temporary. And if you haven't realized it yet, you, your day is coming. 
Uh, you, you'll feel it one day. In verse 2, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Every time I think about the fact that I'm going to have a perfect body, I think, oh, give it to me now. You know, that groan. Of, I'm re some, there are some days, I'm telling you, when <laughs> I just think, I wish, I wish I could just shed this temporary body and get my perfect permanent body. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. It isn't that we want out so much as we want in. There are some people that want out. They, they have an escapist mentality. I, I don't like life. I don't like what God has created. I want to get away. And I'll just tell you something. If they're saved, if they're trying to escape from God, the first person they're going to see is gone. And if they're lost and they're trying to escape from God, the last person they're going to see is gone. So an escapist mentality doesn't make any sense. But there is something to this wanting to be in the new body. In other words, it isn't that I want out of this body so much as I want in the new one. Mm -hmm. That's the mindset for believers. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. Verse 5, Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing as God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Now that is, earnest is of course a word for down payment, and it is the, the evidence that God says, you know, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, heaven is your home, and the evidence of that is that I've left my Spirit in you left my spirit with you. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, this body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And then he goes on to elaborate. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that... <clears throat> Everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Look back at verse 8. Willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So here's the question. If we're in this physical body today and we come to the place where we leave this physical body, being absent, being absent from this body means I will be present where? With the Lord, with the Lord Jesus. Okay, so where do believers go when they die today? And we say, heaven, they go to be with the Lord. The place where God dwells. Heaven is up. God is certainly probably beyond the heavens. He's separated from us. There's a separation. But that those of us who are separated have been made near or nigh by the blood of the Lamb. And so to be absent from the body, we know is to be present with the Lord. We don't know where that physical location is, but we know where... We know that this is a new concept. Go with me, with you, if you will, to Luke chapter 16. And this is where we'll finish this evening. Luke chapter 16. Jesus is teaching His disciples and teaching them a number of parables. And he gives the parable of a steward. He gives a parable of serving two masters. And uh, in verse 16, he explains the time and the age in which they are living. In verse 16, he says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. There was a certain rich man. This is where we will begin our focus. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Okay. Now the question is, is this a parable or is this an actual real account? Uh, if it were a parable, there are a couple of ways that we could know it were a parable. First of all, Jesus, the Word of God would say, and He spake a parable unto them, saying, or something like that. In other words, Jesus would say, I'm not speaking literally here, I'm speaking uh, in, in an illustrative way. I'm illustrating, a, uh, I'm illustrating a truth, or I'm hiding a truth 
from unbelievers and I'm telling a story to get your interest that I'm going to elaborate on later. That's what a parable, I've heard people, you ever heard a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, you ever heard defined that way? Well, if you actually look at a parable, Jesus said that he told parables so that unbelievers would not have access to truth. He told parables to hide truth from unbelievers. And when the disciples came, you know that the truth was also hidden from them. They said, what do you mean? And then he would explain the parable to them. And so a parable was told for the purpose of concealing truth not for illustrating an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. If that were true, then after his great illustration, all the unbelievers would have come to Jesus uh, in those moments. So study that and look at it. A parable is not I'm, not, I'm not throwing away, trashing the definition, but it really isn't an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It is, it is the way that Jesus used to conceal truth from unbelievers and to illustrate truth to those who had a heart to believe after he explained it. So this is not a parable, first, because Jesus did not say it was a parable. Secondly, in parables, there's a certain man or a, a uh, certain person, but there's never a name. The Bible says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, some, per, some fared sumptuously every day, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. And then also we see that in hell, this, this uh, rich man saw Abraham afar off. Okay, so... Abraham's a real person, and Abraham's alive, and so Jesus is listing and naming real people. And it would be making rather light of hell, making rather light of Abraham's bosom, actually. Wouldn't it be to reference, yeah, this fake guy saw Abraham. You see, you understand what I'm, what I'm saying? If it, if it were not a real story of a real person, an actual account that actually happened, then it kind of makes light of it. So what do we have here? What we have a description in the dispensation in which Jesus was teaching his disciples of hell and the place where believers rested waiting for the completed work of the cross, Abraham's bosom. And we see a description here where we see that between heaven and hell, there's a great gulf fixed. There's a division. Uh, Abraham describes it actually when he's asked in verse 24, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, by the way, isn't it sad the man's Jewish? Isn't that sad? Father Abraham. Now I recognize that the Bible teaches that we have Abraham for our father because of our belief in Jesus. But this is a man who has not believed in Jesus, and Abraham he recognizes as a father. Isn't it sad that the descendants of one who believe God and His faith was counted for righteousness, is in hell, separated from Father Abraham, and yet knows who Father Abraham is and recognizes that relation to him. And isn't it sad for Abraham as well? Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in thou, thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And, but Abraham said, Son. Isn't that sad? Here, look at that word, the Father and the Son there, and think of the sadness of the separation of hell and the and uh, and uh, the Abraham's bosom. What a sad separation there is between believers and unbelievers. And old friend, you ought to appeal to believers, or I ought to appeal to unbelievers, and say, "Don't be separated from me. Don't make me have to be separated from you for eternity. Don't don't cause that tragedy to happen because of your unbelief." Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, thou art tormented. But look at verse 26. And beside all this, beside, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. He said, I cannot send Lazarus because of the gulf, because of that separation between hell and Abraham's bosom. I cannot send Lazarus because of the separation. Now, of course, there's a lot of application. We've probably heard messages on hell where we talk about the separation between heaven and hell and the permanences of the choices that we make and the decisions, the fact that the grave does seal all choices and they are thereby made permanent. And because of the gulf, we cannot uh, pass from one to the other. But this is a physical gulf. And we recognize that the place where Abraham's bosom was was a place where literally those who slept in Jesus rested and the idea slept in Jesus means they died 
believing in Jesus. And by resting, we do not mean that they are soul sleeping, that is, they're unconscious until God resurrects them. What we mean by that is that they're in a real place and it's a place of rest. But the other place that is separated from that real place is in a similar geographic location, except it's separated by a gulf, and that place is hell. It's a real, literal place. We know that the Bible says that hell hath enlarged itself. We know that today to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We also have further information when we see upon the resurrection or upon the death of Christ on the cross that the saints which were in the graves came out of the graves and went into the city. That's when Abraham and his kids got out. Well, that'd make a great Christian song, wouldn't it? I'm just kidding. Don't, don't write it. Anyway. Sometimes things occur to me and probably be better left on sin. But that literally is when Abraham and uh, his children who slept in Jesus came out of the grave. And where did they go? Did they stay in Jerusalem? We have gospel account that they uh, they ascended, that they came out of the graves. Where did they go? They went to heaven with Jesus. They're present with the Lord. That's why in 2 Corinthians... We use the word heaven. They went to be with the Lord. They are with the Lord. Before, they were separated from God because the redemption work was not completed. But my friend, not just upon Jesus' resurrection, but the death of Jesus allowed them to no longer be separated from God. Even before the resurrection, they came out of the graves. Isn't that wonderful? It's a wonderful truth. Okay, so let's... Let's wrap it up, let's tie it up, and let's try to comprehend enough to help ourselves. When we use the terms heaven and hell, we need to have a clear picture in our mind what we're saying. When we use the term, oftentimes what we are saying is the place where God is. And so I think maybe it would be more accurate if when we are sharing the gospel or appealing to lost people or teaching our children, it would be more accurate to, instead of using the term in heaven, to maybe describe the place where God is. The New Jerusalem, we could call it. We could call it the place, the place where God is preparing mansions for us. I go to prepare a place for you. It's a geographic spot that man cannot achieve, that you can only get there by the means of Jesus Christ, who is the only one who has ascended from heaven. And literally, he's not talking about the place where God is. He's just saying, I came from up. <laughs> and you don't know where heaven is when he told Nicodemus, no man hath ascended unto heaven, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. So every person, in order to get to where God is, needs Jesus. Where's the geographic location of God? Well, it wouldn't be geographic because geo means earth. He's not on earth. Although Brother Matt says he is. He says he's everywhere. Which is true. God's presence is everywhere. His Spirit is certainly in us. And He's in this place this evening bodily. The Holy Spirit of God is representing Christ in this place this evening. Jesus is literally in us and in this place tonight represented by God's Spirit. But physically, God is, in, God is on His throne. And every person who has ever slept and knew Jesus as their Savior is with God. A real physical place. And after God's done destroying the old heaven and the old earth, the new heaven and the new earth are going to be created. And heaven's quote where God is, is going to descend. It's going to be the New Jerusalem. It's going to be right there. It's going to be the predominant feature on the new earth. And we'll have access to God in the new earth. And so where are we going to live for eternity? I well, we say with God on the new earth. Probably not so much in heaven because heaven will be Descend, Jerusalem will be descending. I'm sure I know 1,500 miles gets into the heavens, right? Depends on what you need, what the legal terms of heaven are. I don't know exactly. However, these are descriptions of our future. Remember, Christian, where does a person go when he dies today and he doesn't know Jesus as his Savior? Where does he go? Same place? Hell. Lake of Fire comes later. That gets cast in the Lake of Fire. We saw that in chapter 20. So where does a person go when they die today? They go to hell if they don't know Jesus. Where does a person go today if they die and they know Jesus as their Savior? 
be with the Lord. They go to be with the Lord. The Lord Jesus. And I know sometimes we quibble over terms. Sometimes we get specific and technical. But you know, I think sometimes we're a little bit too generic about things too, aren't we? We're going to talk enough about what happens and the differences. And I think that sometimes a lot of believers don't even know that it used to be different before Jesus finished the work on the cross. It's important to point out the benefits and the signification. Days going to come when God's going to wipe away all the tears from our eyes. There's going to be no more sorrow, no more death, no more tears, no more crying. None of these things, the former things, are going to be passed away. And if you know Jesus, my friend, you'll be there. And if you don't know Jesus, my friend, you will not be with the Lord. We have a compassion and concern for those who fit that description. Father, thank you for the teaching from your word this evening. I pray that you'll help us with our comprehension, to absorb it, to understand it, and most of all, to practically apply it. We ask in Jesus' name. You're dismissed.